Boot Camp for today, Tuesday, July 19th. We're excited to have everybody with us. Hopefully, if you've been on vacation, you've had a good vacation. If you're going on vacation soon, we hope you have a great vacation. I hope you're on vacation this week. Uh, thanks for joining us for vacation. Um, I'm Robert Theobald, Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services, and uh, glad to be with you today. As we like to do, we like to start by thanking all of our community partners. We could not do these boot camp sessions without our community partners, their time, their effort, and their expertise. For those not familiar, or those just joining for the first time, the Small Business Boot Camp is designed to help small businesses prepare, plan, and grow. It is a statewide initiative supported by all of our community partners. And not only is it the webinar that we do every Tuesday morning, 9 a.m., it is a content library and a series of workshops. So let's look first at the content library. The content library is found on our bootcamp webpage at the very bottom of it. And it features the collection of webinars, our bootcamp webinars that we've done for over the last two years, two plus years. We have over 200 recorded webinars on there and you can access those at no cost. You can access them at any time and you can even sort them by seven different categories. You can see them there, accounting, finance, business resources, COVID, uh, leading and managing legal, marketing, business sales and service. So um, there's a lot of information in that content library. And if even after sorting, you can't find the topic you might be looking for, feel free to reach out to us and we can guide you to information that uh, on, on those sessions that can help you with your business. And if for some reason there's not a topic that we, we haven't hit yet, then we will make sure we get that on an upcoming bootcamp session. So with that, we wanted to talk quickly about some of the other programs that we have here at the Arizona Commerce Authority to support small business. We have our small business services, our workforce, and our Arizona MEP, our Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Uh, if you have additional questions about these programs, you can find information on our website, azcommerce.com, um, or again, you can reach out to us as well. Another great program that we have is our Small Business Checklist. And this is an online interactive tool to help uh, entrepreneurs understand the commonly requested licensing, registration, and compliance needs at the local, state, and federal levels. Uh, there's a lot of great information in here. And if you're just looking for a really quick answer or something very simple, we also have our virtual assistant, Sally. You can see her there in the corner of the screen. Um, through our virtual assistants, you can find some quick answers. If you're looking for much more detailed information, you want to dive right straight into the checklist. Um, so next, we want to talk about our upcoming sessions. So we've got a great lineup plan over the next month or so. Um, we've got uh, preparing for the 2022 holidays. And you may be asking, why are we talking about Christmas in July? <laughs> well, one of the key things there is if you're not planning now and making, uh, making those plans, making those purchases, adjustments, and different things in July with the supply chain slowdowns and other factors, you might miss the ball come December. So we want to make sure uh, we talk about that and some strategies to help you prepare properly. As we know, many businesses, uh, the holiday season is the majority of their sales. So we want you to have a great success there. Uh, and then on August 2nd, we have delegate without pain, misery, and regret. We know some of the challenges of small businesses is delegating things that need to be done. And so we've got a great session plan there. Uh, and then we've got rebuilding and refocusing your team. And then, as I mentioned earlier, with the Small Business Bootcamp, one part of it is workshops. We have our Small Business Bootcamp workshop series with the Phoenix Business Journal. Um, our next session is Tuesday. It's actually Thursday, August 11th, not Tuesday, August 11th. Uh, Thursday, August 11th, from 9 to noon. Uh, the main focus is the in-person aspect of it, but there will be a Zoom option. Uh, the in-person will be at the Arizona Commerce Authority offices and our conference rooms. And uh, there is a small bonus for those in attendance by the Phoenix Business Journal. You can find information about that on our website, but uh, take a look at that. It's called Grow Your Business, Access to Capital and Other Resources. As you look to grow your business, sometimes you need capital, sometimes there's other resources and things you may need. 
Uh, so we're gonna chat about those over the three hour workshop. So with that, we wanna jump into today's session. Uh, we're glad to have Donna Hoover Ojeda back with us again uh, for the third part in her series that she's been doing. Um, so we're excited uh, about that. So Donna, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and turn the time over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Welcome everybody. And yes, if you have questions, please ask Faith. I am not gonna be looking at the chat or the Q&A screen. So Faith or Robert, either one of you, if there's questions that come through, please bring them up. Yeah, yeah. so if you have questions, please place the questions. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, it says Q&A, post them in the Q&A. And that will allow us to use the chat for some interaction that Don may have with questions she may ask uh, the attendees. Um, but please post your questions in the Q&A. Good, thank you. Um, the reason I say that many of you have participated in a lot of these webinars and, and workshops that when the speaker's looking at the Q&A and the chat at the same time that they're trying to present, it's really difficult. And, and the people asking the questions appreciate it, but the ones that aren't don't appreciate it. So, so it's easier if one of the moderators takes care of it. Um, welcome, everybody. It's middle of July. I see we have a really good attendance. I was telling Robert I was so surprised for two reasons. One, I thought middle of July, everybody's on vacation. And that's not true. He has really good attendance. And then the second one is um, that it's about you know habits. Habits has to do with discipline and how to make yourself successful. And a lot of times that's where people fall short is on the successful habits. Habits require routine and just like I said, discipline. So we'll go through some of that. And I thought there would be less, but I'm really glad and excited to see everyone here. Let's get started. Uh, wanted to review right where we start out. I did not put this on the last couple of slides. So this is our third series of, of like I said we did one and two, I think in June. And so we'll review those real briefly on the next charts. But to give you a mindset of where we're starting, the, there's data that um, this presentation is based on and all of our work at Mighty Underdogs is around helping small businesses. We found that there's a gap in companies that are three to seven years old that they, you kind of age out of the startup category, but you're not quite big enough for the you know, five to 10 million um, benefits that are out there. So it's really difficult to get past that, you know, third to fifth year where you're getting your second or third or fourth employee. And what do we, how do we actually turn this great idea into a real business, something more than, the, than just an idea? So to give you some perspective, there are 41 million businesses registered with the IRS. 97% of those are less than 10 employees. So that would be many of you on this call. 97% though, that's a lot, um, under 10 employees. And many of those are solopreneurs. Uh, 4.1 million new startups since 2020. 2 million will not make it past their second year. 2 million of the 4.1 will not make it. We lose 50% of their startups in their second, going into their third year. And then of those ones that do survive, 1.4 will not make it past their fifth year. So you can see where the, the Arizona Commerce Authority and the boot camp and the SBA put a lot of effort and emphasis on helping you not just start your business, but how do we help, how do they and we help you keep going? so that we build a workforce and move into workforce development because we lose many of our companies. So that gives us about 700,000 out of the 4, 4 million that will actually be around still in 2025. So these programs are designed for you to grow your business and expand. Let's take a quick poll if we can, if, if Faith is able to do that. 
on, uh, I think we've done it the last two times. How many are, how many people on the call are over five employees and how many are under five employees? Uh, I think the last time we did that, we did, we did revenue, didn't we? We did it over a million and under a million. Let's do it, let's stick with employees and see what they come up with. So while, while she's putting that poll together, um, I'll review our first, first part that some of you may have attended, which is was the barriers to growth. And the barriers, which I've talked to some people afterwards, and they said, well, actually, if we can get through these barriers, they become catalysts for growth. And so that was the plan. How do, how do we identify the three barriers so we can get to profitable growth? And we have leadership, how our company changes, um, how it grows, because you, when you move from a founder to a partnership to developing a VP, like a C-suite, your leadership changes. Um, and your structure changes, so that moves us into systems and structure. Oh, and the leadership piece is also delegation. Because leadership is about even if you're a single person, a solopreneur, how do you how do you use the outside world to help you? Use your vendors, use your customers, use ACA, use uh, the SBA, use all the resources that are available to you. That's leadership as well. Um, and then um, systems and structures. What kind of systems do we put in place to support the? The, our leadership style and our customers and our companies. And what kind of structure do we have? Structure me is about communication. I think many of you seen in organizations, they have an organizational chart. You even have that if you're a solopreneur. Um, and that's, that's how, how do we communicate with each other? What are the communication lines look like? And then the other, the system piece is about the, um, technology systems, the software systems that we use, and how do, how do we connect those so that the, the right people are talking to the right people at the right time in the right way, like a CRM system. I know that Robert has some workshops on here, some webinars on CRM systems and how to track lead generation, sales. How do you track those relationships? And then we look at market dynamics, uh, is what's happening outside the world, like the pan pandemic, things you cannot control. How do we plan? And a lot, a lot of times they're predictable, but if they're not, how do you leverage it and go with it? The next one. Oh, under. Okay, good. Good. I see we have 90 cents, just like the statistics say, right? Um, under 500 employees, no, five employees. We need five and over because everybody's going to be under 500 probably. So if we could maybe do that poll again and do the five and play, above five and below five. Um, so then our second workshop webinar was around vision to, vision to execution. So the first one is about barriers. What's in our way? What do we have to work with? What do we have to manage? So when we talk about strategic planning and executing our vision, it's not about it's not about what we're making or what we're doing. It's about how we're doing it and running our business. So this discussion today is a third part of how you're running your business. Because running your business is a game all by itself. And so how do we how do we master that game and how do we plan for that game and grow that game and be the best at it? There you go. Five employees and under five employees. So we did an execution roadmap, which is available to you uh, in the boot camp um, portal as well. It's getting your strategic plan into one page so that you can execute it. So we talked about that and gave you a template that you can work with and talked about many templates that are out there that you can work with, but it's important to have a template. And when I say a, a plan or a template, it's not a booklet, it's a one page so that you can share it with other people and you can, have metrics that go with it, which is what we're going to talk about today, is how do we grow our companies? Oh, pretty good, pretty good split. Good. We have uh, half of the employee, half of, have over five employees and half have under five employees. Good. Thank you. 
So the first one was barriers to growth. How do we get there? What do we look at? What gets in our way? And what do we need to work with as an owner of our business? Second piece is the roadmap. What does it look like? How do I document it? How do I write it down so that I can plan it, grow it, and move it and adjust? The next Donna, case that, yeah. Sorry, real quick on that. For those that may have missed the barriers to growth and your growth formula webinars, you can find those. I was trying to get the links and, and, plot and put it in the chat, but my computer's not letting me, but you can find those on the bootcamp website. If you go down to the content library and just click um, view all webinars, you'll find them in the second, probably the second row of webinars. Um, because we did them just back in June, not long ago. And so they're right there mm -hmm. towards the top, but they're real easy to find. Good, thank you. For some of you that don't know who I am or missed the first two, um, again, uh, to reiterate to, uh, Robert, that I'm Donna Hover from Mighty Underdogs. And I've been doing growth strategies, growth formulas for about 35 years for companies pick them up at the beginning around 125 million and grow them to 500 million because there are barriers to growth and there are certain things that happen at different stages. So I grow them from 125 to 500. Now, a lot of my clients have grown to the 500 to the 800 and working on a billion. And there's been mergers and acquisitions that go with that. So I'm, we're always looking for smaller companies to purchase and acquire. I work with um, the University of Arizona in their tech launch program as a um, commercialization partner. I'm working with the university on, again, the University of Arizona and their center of innovation, because many of my clients are, in order to grow, are looking to purchase other companies or ideas or people. So I'm interested, continue to be always interested in the smaller companies and helping them be good, successful, solid companies, what do they look like? And that's what we're going to talk about today is what does that look like? And how do you, how do you practice being a good company? What does a good company look like? What do people look for? Maybe we can do another um, webinar on some of that kind of information. Um, but the habits that we look for is uh, successful habits to growth are priorities, rhythm, and metrics. And we'll, we'll We'll review each one of those. And the good news is that there's some simple, practical habits that will help companies grow. Where this information comes from in the last, in these three part series is the 5,000 companies that I've worked with. People have always asked what the best ones look like. And how many, surprising question, is how many companies are really good? And it's a dangerous question, but working with that many companies, I would say about there's 3% that are actually really, really good. And that's a very small number. The rest get distracted by leadership issues or market issues or systems and structures, or they don't wanna do, the habits aren't very, very strong or very well-developed. So it doesn't, there's good companies, but the really great ones have some practices that they do on a regular basis and they they rarely waver from it very predictable so they're simple they're practical and they help they do help you overcome the barriers with the practice just like any other exercise if you do it on a regular basis life becomes simple the first one is they have priorities you, I know that there have been some of the workshops in here that talk about goal setting. So that's a piece of it. You can have lots of goals. I talked to some of these small companies that are starting and said, I have, I have probably 50 goals. Okay, but we need to, need to prioritize which ones can we do and which ones are wishes and which ones are good ideas. And um, I've, I also know that many of my business owners and entrepreneurs claim to have ADD or ADHD, which is the best kind because that's who an entrepreneur is. They have a million things going on at one time. So how do we, we have, we do have tools to help group and capsulize and capture what are the top three to five and the number one goal. And that's where they come up with three to five different businesses sometimes. But let's just start with one business and get that going. And then when you can get a good pattern down and a good rhythm for company one, 
then we could duplicate. So that's what these habits are for, is how do we duplicate a success? So prioritize, prioritize your top three to your top five and your number one. We also will talk about a rhythm, which is the executive team meeting or your team meetings. And if you're a solopreneur, it's including, uh, hopefully you have an advisory board or which is made up of your customers and important people to you, but you have an advisory board of some sort. Um, you don't usually have a board of directors, but you have a team that you work with that are external. They may be 1099 people. They may be potential partners, other business relationships, but you have a team that you work with because you can't do everything alone. The game of business is not meant to be played alone. So I think most of you have figured that out by now. If you get into your third to fifth year, you figure it out that you can't play alone. You, you will not succeed playing alone. And you do need SBA and the Arizona Commerce Authority to help with connections, relationships, reaching out, growing outside of your community matters. So the last piece that we'll look at is the uh, data-driven metrics. And I get companies that, okay, they start with the first one, they can get those 50 goals, the 20 goals, the 10 goals, the five goals, because there's a lot of workshops around that, a lot of webinars on how to do goal setting. But the rhythm, they fall short on the rhythm because that requires discipline. And then the metrics requires even more discipline. So if you can get those three intact, it becomes a circle. Your metrics drive your priorities. So we'll continue down that path that taking a look at our priorities, uh, they start at the top, they started with the leader, not from the bottom. <laughs> However, in today's environment, we do work with teams more so than in a hierarchy system, depends on where you're coming from. Um, but I know the younger generation, younger being 35 and below, they like to work in teams and teams are really hard to work with, but they work in teams. And that means your priorities really have to be clear. Your roadmap has to be really clear and your metrics have to be spot on. And having the behavior to uh, your rhythm has to be spot on as well. So these habits are most important when you're working with a network of companies. So it starts at the top, starts with the leader. Can't have, can't have five people leading, even though you say you're a team, only one person can lead. And you have three to five focus areas that you're working on that will get you to your number one goal. Issues where leadership, where leadership team focuses will have the greatest impact. Where you spend your energy will move because your job as a leader for your company. Remember um, some of our other conversations, I talked to you about when you own a company, run a company, you self-identified that you're a leader in your community. So a leader in your community, not just in your business and not just as a solopreneur, you are identified through the government as well and through your, your religious communities, your neighborhoods. People know if you're a business owner, you, you're willing to lead something. And so you have a, you'll have a tendency to be asked to lead more things. So again, it's keeping focused on what are you leading and where are you leading? Where can I make a biggest difference? And then look at your three-year horizon, your one year and your quarterly. So I wanted to bring this back up. This is from our last workshop, our last webinar on uh, vision to execution. This is the back page that ties to the habits. So when we look at our three year, one year, and then to the right hand side are your quarters. Those quarters have goals that relate to what are your one year initiatives? Like what do I want to complete this year? And how's that gonna get me my three year growth? If I wanna sell in three years or merge my company or do something with my company, what is it you wanna do? What do I need to look like? And there is a pattern of what people expect, other companies and outsiders expect to see. 
in your one-year initiatives, your three-year focus areas, and your quarterlies are really up to you on how you're going to achieve those one year. But the orange pieces at the top of each of these, the one-year, three-year, and quarterlies are for your metrics. So you have a place to track. It's not a fail or succeed. It's are we completing and are we doing what we say we're going to do and is it working? Next piece is the rhythm. I was telling Robert before we got started here that out of these three sessions, the first one being barriers to growth, and that's usually like a morning discussion for companies. And then the roadmap is an afternoon for a company. And then I spend the rest of the next two years working on these habits. So the habits are, are that important to get your execution of your vision to actually happen. And the barriers to growth are the things that influence us and, and get in our way. So the, the, all three of these sessions really do go together. They're just big, big lifestyle life bites to take on. So when we talk about the rhythm, it's the pace that you evaluate. Um, our IRS system takes us, if we have, it's a time frame. how frequent are you, are you measuring? IRS has us measuring once a year, our financials. We turn on our numbers once a year. Many people only do their numbers once a year. So you're waiting to the end of the year. We used to do strategic planning once a year in the corporate world. They figured out that, um, and smaller companies are more agile, but we figured out if you wait till the end of the year, it's kind of too late. You're always behind in trying to get something to happen. The description, the analogy that we use is uh, when you're in college, that many students wait till the, la the night before to cram for a test, and the chances of your, of your results are just chance. That if you break it up and actually have quarterly reviews, quarterly reports, monthly reviews, increase their frequency that you're reporting and looking at your data, your results will increase dramatically, almost five to six fold. They will increase dramatically. When I work with companies that I go in quarterly, I ask them how, how often are they meeting? And they say haphazardly three times a year, two to three times a year. It's not enough. We move it to once a month to get to increase the rhythm, the frequency, to get that heartbeat going, because it really is a heartbeat. How fast are you moving? For entrepreneurs, when I, you have 90 day record, 90 day goals, 90 day metrics, I, I decrease that and speed it up because you are more agile and you can do it in 45 days. 30 days is too soon, too short. But 45 days, six weeks, you get a pretty good read on your decisions, on your actions, your activity, your results. You can get results in a in good number of results in six weeks. So that's what this is talking about is how long am I willing to go to wait for results? I get lots of companies, lots of people. They say, well, we're going to wait and see what happens. Or we're going to, we put it, we submitted a bid to government and we're gonna wait. Or we submitted a bid to a big company and we're gonna wait. We, you can't wait. You gotta keep moving and do something else to keep it going. Because we have 30 day metrics, 45 day metrics that we need to meet. So what, what else can we do to keep it moving? You're trying to increase the heart rate and the heartbeat of your company. So the pace is really important and a fast pace for a small business. That's why small businesses gain traction so much quicker than a big company because you can move very fast, but you need the metrics in there to get repeatability and sustainability. And what does that look like? What does a meeting rhythm look like that we talk about? Well, what is that frequency? I'll start from the bottom. You have daily huddles, should be 15 minutes. They're phone calls. They're quick check-in on your 90-day goals. Quick check-in. Are you on track? Are you off track? That's it. You have weekly team meetings that are one hour. 
Again, you'll see those come in as a sales meeting on a Monday or on a Friday. Sometimes I find them on both sales meetings are on Fridays or on Mondays on how we're going to do for the week. What's our plan for the week? And then on Friday, how did we do for the week? Did we meet the goals that we set on Monday? Where did we fall short? What do we need to do next? How do we make next week better? And then your monthly meetings are more operations oriented. You know, how's the business running? And the quarterly, quarterly team meetings, and they say they're off site. Typically, if you can just go out to lunch, get a conference room somewhere. Even if you're a solopreneur, take, take a couple of your advisors to lunch, take your best customers to lunch, talk to them about what are you doing, what's going on, or if you're still uh, Zooming it, which is fine, you just schedule a meeting because you want to check in. It's, there's nothing more than checking in. Tell, share with them what your roadmap looks like. Your best customers are your advisors, whether you know it or not, they are your advisors. They want you to be successful but they, because that makes them successful. And the only way they can be successful helping you is if they know what you're trying to do. They will help you. A lot of times they, uh, I have run into, I started my business in 1987. I've had customers pay me more. I can do price increases. I can ask for things that may not, may be out of the scope of work, but I need money. They'll ask, what do you need money for? They'll help invest in my company without anything exchange, except they want to be first to receive the new service or the new product. So there's, there's a lot of ways and reasons to include your customers in where you're trying to go and how you're trying to grow. And also include them in your challenges and your struggles. But don't do those kind of discussions on their meeting, on their dime. Do it on, on your own. And it's all about you asking for their partnership, asking for their fellowship, asking for their help. Those are on the quarterly meetings. They will be there for you. Um, annual team meetings, those are usually, when I say team, Offsite, you have a group of people that help you, whether they're, again, your 1099, as you try to get everybody together, we used to call them uh, holiday parties, we used to call them company picnics, um, those activities are still important, even when we're working in a virtual world, there has to be a way, and we're trying, all companies are trying to find a way to bring the team members together, even if you get involved in NFTs, kind of have that that flavor to it. You know, how can we exchange electronically? How can we be part of a club? How can we be part of a team? Uh, I have a couple of small businesses that have three to five employees right now that they are a global company doing exporting of little protein bars. And their team that they're creating, they have a, they're getting together at NFT. They have an ambassador club. And bringing their teams together and playing games and, and, you know, to reward them for being part of a club and incentivizing them to expand their sales. So there's a lot of things you can do with the internet and with uh, augmented reality that people are getting into. Just throwing out some ideas of, of ways you can stretch your thinking of what an annual team meeting would look like. Oh, that's right. Somebody had told, had mentioned to me that, uh, that if I have all these meetings, it just takes too much time. I can't do it. it. Takes too much time. So I put together, I added up the time, time frame out of 2000 hours, 2000 hours is a work year, right? That you add up those, the hours that this requires, uh, it's only 3% of your time. You, if you don't have three, you have to have more than 3% of your time to make your business grow because it's not just about what you're serving and what you're delivering. It's about how you're running your business that matters more because people are watching. People are taking a temperature. People are asking. They're looking at how is, is he or she running their business? Because if you run a good business, people will want to work with you, both as employees and as customers. So think about that as you work on your company. 
because the company, again, a successful company is, is not easy. There's a lot of variables that go into running a business and it's all about the people. Business is easy if it weren't for the people. We've all have heard that before. Our employees cause us issues and problems and our customers cause us issues and problems. Yes, they do. So how you manage those and lead through those trials and tribulations, people are watching and there are tools out there to help you. And then I provide for you in this, in this webinar so that you have it is what does that schedule look like and what do you cover? You know, what should I talk about? That's what I have people ask me. Well, if I have all these meetings, what do I talk about? What am I looking at? You're really looking at your, your vision to execution, that roadmap. What, where are you on that roadmap? And how's it performing? And what's it doing? Is it working? Um, where do we need to make adjustments? Uh, how, what are strategic initiatives coming up? How are we gonna move this faster? Look at your quarterly spot. It says priorities, your top three to five rocks, accountabilities and metrics. Who's doing what? And are they uh, struggling with that? How can you help them with it? You're there as a business owner and a business leader to provide resources, not to do the work. I understand if you're a solopreneur, some of it you have to do, but some of it you find resources that do the work for you because it's, it's all about who you're connected to and the, the networks that you're part of, leveraging your relationships, leveraging your networks, leveraging the expertise that you have access to. Okay, so you have that daily huddles, weekly meetings, monthly meetings, Quarterly are operational, annually is strategic. Uh, another piece of, of warning or a heads up on your meetings that you have, whenever you put your meeting agendas together, if you don't wanna use this, this format, but as a, as a rule of thumb, a person's brain cannot think operations, which is tactical, at the same time you're asking them to do strategic and creative. So, so on a worst case basis, split those meetings, even if it's the same people. You do nine to 10 operations, all tactic, all um, metrics, all objectives, and then you stop the meeting, you have a break, and then you have a strategic one, and that's done all around creativity. Um, future barriers, what do we have that's good? What do we have that we need to fix? What's the marketplace want? What do our customers want? Two very, very different meetings. So if that's, if that's all you get out of this presentation, <laughs> to, to remember that, to separate the thinking. People just can't do both at the same time, okay? Cascading message down here at the bottom left. Uh, people that are not included, sometimes when you have these, these lever, um, these level of meetings, you think that everybody should be included. Not everybody wants to be included. They just want to know what the output is. What did you discuss? Give me a review. Give me an overview. They don't want to be bogged down with all the, the discussion. So the, the commitments and cascading messages are, is what you share with others when you leave. You all you agree to send you know an email. Here's what we talked about or a video of someone talking about, here's what we talked about in the meeting today, blah, 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 blah. So that everybody gets the same message and the same commitment levels and the same target items. So that you'd have three or four topics that you just got, again, back to your priorities, share what became a priority out of these meetings. Okay, and then the data piece, because we run all of our meetings on data, Always run your meetings on data, not on what someone said or what you think or what you feel. Always run your meetings on data. The, 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 the emotion side it does have value when the data, helping you explain the data or addressing the data. So what kind of data are we looking at in the metrics? There are standard corporate numbers that we use. Um, I'm kind of stuck in that word corporate because what does that mean? There are standard numbers that everyone uses. 
I just nomenclature the corporate numbers, but financial and operating numbers and ratios, everybody knows those. The government makes you report those. Banks make you report those. Um, other agencies want you to report your operating numbers. And those are all rear view mirror, rear view look, rear view mirror type metrics that they you have already done something. And so they're looking at what you have done. Do you have a, a track record of meeting your commitments? Because financial and operational, you know, whether you're, sometimes you can qualify for things if you're not making money. Sometimes you qualify if you're making some money, some you qualify if you're making a lot of money. It really depends on what you're trying to do. But the financials and the operating numbers give you a, uh, a level in the sand of where you are or a level of the water where you are. It's not a judgment number. They're, nobody's judging you whether it should be good or bad because how do they know? They don't know your business. They don't know what your goals were. So, but for an internal purpose, we need, we need to look and see, well, have the decisions we've made in the past been good decisions or bad decisions? And what did we do to correct them if they were bad? Because that happens. And what did we do to leverage if they were good? So you're really looking at results. I either had lower results than I expected or higher results than I had planned. So how do we leverage what had happened with those? And then we have smart numbers. Smart numbers are ones that have leading indicators. Leading indicators are kind of predicting the future, the tea leaves. What do the tea leaves tell me? What's around the corner? Um, and I work with uh, Desert Angels as well. And so we're always looking at, okay, what's just around the corner? What's on that edge of, of um, to being disruptive, but not destructive? Two, two, two different things. So what's on the edge? And what's the leading indicator comes from one industry to another? We watch, I, one of the leading indicators I'm looking at right now that I talked to somebody is we're looking at the, the children, because they're our workforce, right? So we're looking at the children that are coming through that are now 10 years old. What are they learning and how are they behaving and how are they being taught? And some of the numbers, the, the studies show that that age group is the wealthiest and have the most things than any other generation before. So if that's the case, what kind of products and services am I, because that's going to be our workforce, how am I going to motivate those people, those children coming through that, you know, when they're 10, okay, they'll be out in the workforce in just eight years. That's not very long. So how do, what do we do with them? And how do we work with them? And how do we grow them? And how do we create jobs? I work with a lot of CEOs trying to create jobs that people want to do. I mean, that's part of the problem with the great resignation is there are a lot of jobs out there, but they're not jobs that people want to do. They're old technology. Who wants to work with old technology? Not very many people. So they'd rather quit and do something on their own than take a job just moving papers. Because some of the com many companies have not adapted, completely adapted and absorbed all the new technology that's out there. And the new kids coming through want to work with the technology. But some of our older CEOs, I mean, we just had it last week. I had one 32-year-old uh, that was very open and honest and said, you know, why are the 65-year-olds still around holding up the jobs and holding up the space that's preventing us from doing some, some good new technology work when they want to keep the old, old processes and old things in place? That's a problem. We have five generations in the workforce today. So on my side and many other consultants, you're either working with that and trying to figure out how, to, how do we work through it? So allowing you know, many of these new startups is a really big help. So those are smart numbers. What kind of things do we need to look at that will lead our future, drive our future? in the next one to two years for your particular business. And then critical numbers are numbers where something is wrong. Something's not turning out the way you would like it to. Um, the one that I think of is social media right now. I have a company that started doing some 
um, increase their social media budget and increase their presence. Uh, they put something out, you know, two, two times a day for 10 weeks and they get a very small number, but that's a metric. That's a critical number that, okay, that tells me that people aren't looking at your stuff. So do you do more of it? Probably not. Change the content and move it a different strategy. That's what you look at is um, where I'm spending my marketing dollars. Am I actually getting the exposure that I had paid for? Right now, that's the critical numbers that people are looking at. Am I getting what I wanted, what I need for my money? And you measure it in real dollars or real numbers, not percentages. Do not use percentages. Percentages get skewed and they get hidden. Oh, it's only 2%, but 2% can also be you know, 200 people that you're missing. That's a bigger number. So real numbers, not percentages. And let's see. Whoop. Uh, I think this next chart, oh, it tells you how to measure it. So you graph it. I think you have some people out there telling you that. And we know that it's easier to look at numbers when we're trying to look at metrics, but when we're trying to show people movement and growth, you have to have a chart. It's either a pie chart, a bar chart, or a line graph, either one of those. Stacked bars are a little difficult to read and compare. So if you can back it down to just one of those three, a line, a bar, or a pie, it works. That's why it's visual, put it up, Stick it up somewhere and stick it up around your companies. Uh, have it as a dashboard. Electronic dashboards are great. If you're able to get to that point, many of the software programs now have dashboards you could use, but you really need to, to funnel each of the categories for the dashboard to work. And you need six points, six numbers. It says six data points, six different pieces of your company you're taking the temperature and they can be different. And I've had people ask me, well, what data points should I be using? Every company is different. It really is because every company, it's not industry standard. It, there's not industry standards. People use the easy one, revenue, and they use another one, um, profit, but there's growth, pro growth pro gross profit and net profit. I prefer net profit, but you know, there's a lot of different numbers to work with. I give you in this uh, webinar is one of the tools is a list of all the things that you can pick from. And I ask people to pick six that work for you. And if you don't like them, use them for two months. If you don't like them, then switch, pick a different six. Pick the ones that work for you, not the ones that tell you a good story. At the beginning, pick any six, we'll get you there. And then you start adjusting to say, well, are we measuring the right things? Well, I don't know. What's your goal? It ties you back to your roadmap again of what are you trying to accomplish? Measure what's important, not what, what is easy, which is what I just mentioned. Use absolute numbers and not percentages. Okay? Here's the list. It's hard to see on a, on a presentation, but when you get the copy um, or the video, you can take a look at it on your own. Uh, the one that I try to use is uh, profit to sales, staff turnover, those are good. Um, employee turnover, there's a sales ratio to number of employees. And remember 1099s are employees in measurement terms, not IRS terms, but in measurement because they're taking time, you're billing their time. Time, business is about time over money. So count all your time when you put your metrics together to see if you're getting the right ratio, time over money. How much did you spend and how much time did you spend on it? And time is collective, okay? Any one of these, and there's even more numbers, but this is just to get you started. Try on these, some are leading, some are lagging, mix them up, change them up. Uh, you can do it on paper, you can do it electronically, takes a little while to get to know how to use your dashboards, how to create dashboards, how to get the right software to get the dashboards that you want. So I usually suggest try it on paper first, see what ones you like, and then that'll help you 
determine what kind of software you need. Um, one that I've just started using is mondays.com and because I'm interested in increasing my sales, increasing my relationships with customers and clients. And so it has a good uh, CRM system in it. And so it's kind of look around. We also have a CEO roundtable or an owner's roundtable that we work with. And we share new software programs, productivity plans all the time. You know, what's working, what's not working? What is that software used for? What's it best used for? How did you use it? Because our metrics, you run your business by your metrics. And that's what the outside world is going to measure you on as well, is your metrics and the relationships that you have. This you can't see so well. I tried to give you an example of how someone just did it on an Excel spreadsheet. So visually, uh, you, can, you can see she put in the websites that she's using. This is her so social media, her marketing um, campaigns that she was doing, where it's being posted, how many times it's being posted, and the results that she was getting. And some of them she's getting zero and some she gets six. She was hoping to get more than that. So she determined after looking at it, said track it, track it for the great thing about social media. And it's not an SEO. SEO is a little more complicated and complex. Social media is very easy to measure, likes and follows. If you're not getting the likes and follows, that's kind of the rate at the basic basic place that what do you need to change and what do you need to look at? Because the sales won't come until your likes and your follows are your leading indicators. So think about that and how you measure and what you're looking at. She decided that uh, social media wasn't for her company. That's not how people buy. So she went on to um, back to personal relationships and went back to her existing customers and her referrals have, have tripled in the last, at least the last three months. So she stopped spending on social media just because everybody says that's where you should be. Doesn't necessarily mean that's true. So, but track your numbers so that you, you know if you're gonna change it in the future, she may change it in September. So now we've got some numbers to work with though. And you can always pull them out when, whenever you need them and restart it, stop it at any time. What is a catalyst for growth? What does a good company look like? Because I've had people always ask that. What is a good company? You have smart, they're smart. They have a good strategy, a marketing plan. They have good finance and they have good technology. When you're pulling your technology together, don't. It, it's hard when people want to create their own because it doesn't integrate with others very well. So try to use many of our small, small businesses and micro businesses. Google has done a great job in doing their Google workspace and all of their productivity tools that go with it. Microsoft is for the little bit bigger company. They're more mid-sized to large. So Google, Google workspace really, really is set up for the solopreneur and the entrepreneur and the small business, small business being under about 20 employees. Once you get to past that spot, then it changes again. But it's it's connecting your strategic, your strategy, your marketing, your finance, and your technology platforms. More technology platforms is not better. Less tech, technology platforms is best because remember you're going to integrate with somebody else because somebody will buy you at some point. And if your technology doesn't integrate well with whoever it is you're looking to have buy you that's gonna cause a problem because you've spent a lot of money and they will have to spend a lot of money changing it. The other side that they look at is healthy. Politics, you have less politics. If you have a roadmap, you pay attention to your, your barriers to growth, know what the timing is, what's in your way, be very clear of what you're working on and, um, and who's doing what, your one year, three year and 90 days. You'll have less politics. Politics looks like cancer. Some companies call it cancer inside. Um, internal gossip, confusion. You'll get higher morale. You'll get higher productivity because people know what to do, who's doing it, and what's expected of them. 
And they also know it's being reported and looked at every 45 to 90 days. And they get a chance to talk about what they're doing and be included in the, the running of the business. Okay. Well. To summarize, we talked about successful habits for growth, priorities, top five, and your number one. Rhythm, 90-day increments. Use your meeting rhythm so that everybody knows what your meetings are about. It's not a hidden agenda every time. They're very predictable. People come prepared and they know when to ask questions and what the topic is gonna to be about because it's always the same. And then you have your, have metrics, have numbers, smart numbers and healthy numbers. How are we doing? Take a temperature. And that's all I have for today. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of pieces, but I know if you focus on one step at a time, you'll make it happen. Thank you. Right. Robert, back to you. Thank you, Donna. Go ahead and keep your contact information up there. Um, we had a question, Carol. The slides and information will be posted on the website later. Um, so yeah, this PowerPoint's not uh, on there yet. It'll, the information will be on the website later today. Um, Andy had a number of questions. Andy, you may want to reach out to Donna directly on a number of those questions, but talking about data, he had a good question. It says, can you, um, it says how to work with controllable versus surprise data? Should you try to separate them? Yes. Very simple, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because controllable data is, is just that. The surprise data is what you're trying to manage. So why is it surprise data? and What's causing the surprise data to be there? So the surprise data becomes your critical number so that it's no longer surprise data. And right. you need more than, one, more than one data point to make it a surprise. Yeah, so just one outlier is not surprise data, but right. we'll, in that area, it is, does become a surprise data. Um, you know, talking about the data and some of the marketing stuff you shared, I want to share a quick example of the previous company I worked at. I was working with some franchisees and I was asking them, they were spending a lot of money on marketing. And I was asking, well, are you tracking the results? Is it working for you? And they couldn't give me that information. And so as a, as a coach within that organization, within that franchisor, um, I was trying to help that franchisee, but they weren't tracking their data to where we could help them, but they were spending a lot. And I could see that they were spending a lot and they weren't seeing the returns um, in the numbers, but we couldn't tell which ones were not the effective because they, weren't, they, weren't, they didn't have that structure set up. They weren't using the technology to track that data. So, um, you know, when you're looking at those things, that, that data you have in your meetings, make sure you can track what your expenditures are on so you can share that data and, and, and work with your team to maximize your return on investment. Mm -hmm. I'll add to that because some people, I do run into a lot of companies that do just that. They say, well, we're spending a lot of money on marketing. This should be working. Well, you can still spend a lot of money. Let's just track it though. So we know where we're spending it and not just stop marketing because it's not doing anything for me. That, that, that's not a good sol solution. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, we are right at time. Thank you, Donna, for another great presentation. Again, for everybody, the slides and the recording will be on our website later today. Uh, so you can go back and access those. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up. We want to remind everybody, to please join us next Tuesday morning, 9 a.m. And we hope everyone has a great rest of their week. Um, until then, uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. Appreciate it.